this film we are going to talk about social construction. This proposes that our identities are constructed from the social interactions that we take part in. By interviewing people from all sections of society, we will examine how this social feedback comes to shape who we are. Right, this week uh, I'm going to be going to court, which is Wilsden Youth Court. I'm going to be there in front of a youth officer, appropriate adult, which will most maybe be my mum, um, uh, a, a yacht officer um, and a judge and um, a, a barrister, which is the person who's against me and who's on the witnesses or the um, victim's side. Um, the, uh, the the barrister will give evidence against me in court to the judge um, and my yacht officer will give reasons why I shouldn't go to prison to the judge. The judge will then come to a verdict, think about what, like, read through my report paper from when I was young, which will be bringing up every time I've been arrested, everything with my mum and dad, all my young stuff, which all of my business from when I was young. And um, then they will then come to a decision whether I get four months in prison, which is one of the options, uh, four do two in Felton Young Offenders or uh, an extension on TAG. Do you think you'll go to prison in your life? Um, I, I, I don't know. I think, I don't know. I think, I think I might. <laughs> I don't, I don't believe I've got just one identity. I feel like, I don't know, I've accumulated many different types of sort of personality and identity over the duration of my life. A lot of them, I think they're sort of inbuilt, you know what I mean, from my environment, the way I've been raised, the way I've been, sort of situations I've been in as of growing up, the people I've hung around with. I feel like I've chosen to take on some specific ones though, like, do you know what I mean, the choice to be vegan and the way I interact with customers, new clients, new leads. It's a very different sort of interaction as to if I was interacting with a friend or someone I've known family for a long time. When I'm in my business role and I meet people who I know socially, maybe, sometimes it can become a sort of awkward interaction. So I can be my normal sort of social face with them, but obviously I've got to try and uphold a bit of do you know what I mean, business, because otherwise the interaction turns into a thing where they, they don't seem to trust my business personality. Sort of, why am I getting this sort of experience with this person which I don't usually have? And then it turns into a, I don't know, sometimes it never surfaces into us ever doing business together, maybe because of this exact awkwardness. Individual identity is made from different social groups. The way you look, the way you behave and the way you speak gives people information about who you are. How do you communicate your gender, your race, your religion, your age, your class or the level of education you have? When we interact, 
we do so based on beliefs about who we are in that particular moment. In this way, it is possible for you to act and feel like a different person according to who you are around. I guess I sometimes call myself a banana. Like, I don't know if you guys have heard that expression before, but it's when you're yellow on the outside and white on the inside. I had a conversation with my Chinese colleagues the other day and they were like, you don't really look Chinese. There, I'm really, really white and Western and I sort of, I teach them about Western food. Whereas when I'm with my other friends, I, I, I seem very, very Asian to them. Like that's my, to most people, and I can't blame them because obviously I look different. That's my defining character. That's my defining characteristic. Your ethnicity and nationality are two of many social groups that make up your identity. The country you were born in shapes how you think and behave, which gives other people a filter through which to see you. I was in Austria. I was brought up in a family and we were kind of socialists and we were proud and I was as an adolescent. Um, I was a socialist activist and that brought me to social work. So I had a very proud identity. So when I went on holidays in other countries, I always felt, well, that's me. When I moved to England, that started to change when I suddenly realized people positioned me very differently than I saw myself positioned. Like, found myself when I worked particularly with people with mental health problems. They suddenly said to me, when they were acute psychotic, Heil Hitler. And I was kind of really hurt because I was always on the other side. I was always seeing myself as opposing right-wing and Nazis. And suddenly I noticed people see me as a Nazi, kind of someone from the Nazis. I think we, we live in a society, or probably particularly in the Western world, I think that we think the identity is part of the personality and who we are and what we make out of it. Um, I don't believe in that. Um, but I believe, yes, there, everyone comes to this world probably with a little bit of temperament, so there is something which you bring. But then I feel it's very much how your environment responds to you which then creates whatever is your identity or personality. And the environment has multi-levels. Your parents, your family, your siblings, your community, the culture the community is embedded, whether you're a subculture of that culture, the society, the law, the current values of that society. So it's a multiple levels, which I believe create what we think is our identity. Many people believe that human identity is not created by society. The majority of these views stem from evolutionary psychology, where all of human behavior is explainable by a universal human nature. Rather, we should see ourselves as one of literally millions of twigs on the ends of a branch of a tree. There's no particular reason to privilege any of those end twigs, except that we're on it, and that's a part of enough reason to be interested. But it's not partnerable to see evolution as moving forwards with the goal of reaching humanity. We, we are human pilgrims, and we start moving backwards in time. And about six million years into the past, we greet our cousins and chimpanzees and bonobos. But we follow our own pathway because we are. One human universal is that we use emotions to decide on how to behave. The lens of evolution helps us to understand why we have emotions at all. But it oppresses society when it explains cultural norms, such as men having more power than women, as not rooted in culture, but in biology. Take any child for a walk down the high street. 
What do they learn are the differences between how girls and boys should act. As an infant grows, the parents will encourage them to practice skills and behaviors that society sees as correct for their gender. The child is told he is strong or she is pretty. Boys may spend their childhood preparing to be the logical one, the strong one and the successful one. Girls may be encouraged to dress well, be caring and not to be competitive and these stories shape how they behave in the future. One wolf for ninjas and one for princesses. They, oh. they think um, boys are more, more into fighting than girls. They think boys are stronger than girls and no. girls aren't at all strong. That is looks like boys they, fighting with boys, but they got very strong muscles, and girls they, they don't have muscles at they, all. They only give like girls. Um, Weak Fairy, stuff. Fairies and princesses and Barbies, but in the boys' section it's like fighting stuff. When children are aged around 12, they begin to form social identities. Self-image, fitting in and forming peer groups become extremely important. At this stage in their life, they are increasingly influenced by what the society says is normal fashionable or acceptable. From school and from like my friends and from adults, um, we found the media and like newspapers um, influence us. So we were asked to um, look through some of these newspapers and, um, and just say our opinion on the things we see inside. Okay, so here they're just like uh, putting in celebrities that had to choose but got them removed. So like here there's like a plaster of getting removed and some are like faded like here and here. And I think that they're doing it because like celebrities are, su are supposed to be like perfect. This part of the newspaper is about like celebrities um, and like they, they are like si all of them are size 10. This article was about a woman who um, she was like obese, like very obese. Um, so she decided to take action. So during three years, she um, she lost weight. And there's a before picture of her like in a swimming costume and an after picture. I just wanted to say it because it says diet gets diabetics back to normal. I don't think it's right to say normal because like so for some people this is normal and for some people this is normal so it's, I don't think it's right to say normal. Yeah, that's a normal. good point actually. Yeah, like everyone is different sizes. Yeah, right? everybody yeah. like th thinks something else is normal. Yeah. I think these magazines put a bad image on girls our age because they think like... When you grow up you have to be like this. When I grow up I have to be like this. I have to dye my hair blonde, I have to be tall, I have to be skinny, but that's not true. Despite social changes, women are still more likely than men to lead lives centered on caring for children and the home. This is not simply a personal choice, but shaped by cultural beliefs such as the belief that women are naturally maternal, emotionally responsive and nurturing. As children grow up, they do so with expectations about what roles they will fulfill as adults, such as having a career, proposing marriage, and at what age they should settle down. My girlfriend wanted to, well my fiance wanted to get married before she was, well be engaged before she was 30. Because I think when you get to 30 there's an expectation on you to, to maybe get married. I don't know what it is, but it seems like a number when you get to 30, that's it, like your life seems to change, you should grow up. And therefore it seems like the best thing, to, the, the right thing to do is to get married. I love, my, I love my girlfriend very much, but I knew, and she made it very clear to me, that in order to have 
kids with me, she wanted to be married, it was really, really important to her. So ultimately, that's why I proposed. Because she's a woman and women get older quicker, kind of. Boys and girls do have the same social goals of like, ha like, getting married, having children, like, being a homeowner. By a certain age, I think that affects boys and girls equally. But there's more pressure on a girl if it doesn't happen because of the biological club. Going on a lot of my friends, definitely that is the case. They feel like they should be married. You should be at a certain stage in your life. You should be married. You should be thinking about having kids and you know you want to be married for like one or two years and then have kids and the whole lot. They, they feel sorry for me. They think that I'm, oh poor Nikki, poor Nikki hasn't, she's 38 and she hasn't met anyone and she isn't married and she's not having kids. They're getting by, they're having kids, they're married, they have a husband, it's all fine but are they really, really happy? I'm not sure. Cultural stories teach us how people of our own gender should behave. But gender is one of hundreds of stories we learn about, such as our age, our line of work and our class. By connecting these stories, we create a bigger story that is completely unique and personal and is called our self-image or identity. We think, feel and act based upon this identity and different people help us to write the story of our identity by giving us feedback in verbal and non-verbal ways. In my work in psychiatry, um, which means I'm a doctor to do with mental health of young people, um, identity issues are a huge issue for what comes through our door because we're often dealing with adolescents. And one of the fundamental dilemmas of adolescence, so moving from being a child to being an adult, whatever that means, is figuring out um, who you are, what you stand for, who you are in relation to other people. But it, it's, it's a crisis of resolving identity. But when we see young people coming through where it's reached a threshold of distress, impacting on their ability to function in their lives, so function at school or employment, in their families or with their friends, narratives about the ad what we're supposed to be or who we're supposed to be or how we're supposed to feel or behave or think are very linked in with that. So if I was going to then try to wonder about what sort of a narrative was affecting a young woman that was taking that on, there might be stories about how women are not supposed to cause a fuss or be a problem to others, how they should be quiet and how they should be qu quietly getting on with things and not um, bothering others. Just to link that to, with say, young men, they've received stories in a, in a different way about you don't show how you feel to others and that might be linked in with men. Um, men are tough and um, they're strong and to be emotional in any way or to show you're not coping is not manly um, and it's not um, acceptable. I'm not, I wouldn't show myself as having been brought up in, well, not a bad way, in, in a way where I've grown up through not having a dad and stuff like that. I wouldn't show that and I wouldn't really mention that to a lot of people. I can't remember the last time that I remember myself being that upset from how I was when I was younger. And not having a dad and that when I was younger, like realising that my dad's not here and all my friends and that they've still got their dad there. And My mum and dad, they used to fight when I was younger. And obviously I can grow up now still thinking in my head, remember clearly like them fighting. I have got a few friends that have been through the same thing and not not have their dad and stuff like that. But um, yeah, no, I don't I don't express that to to a lot of people, to be honest. What about anger then? Can you think of the last time you were angry? Uh, angry. Uh, I get I get angry quite a lot, to be honest. I could get angry if I um, like if I was to get into a fight in school, then 
I wouldn't exactly think about it, but I wouldn't, like, it wouldn't go through my head and think, don't do it. I, I'd just tick, boom, that's it, and then maybe I'd just start fighting. In our field, when people come, we can see the presenting behaviour and try to get beneath that to figure out what's the core difficulty. But I think to the external world, it's much harder for them to get to the distress that's underneath. And actually, what it means is often young men, they get into trouble, they're labelled as bad, as difficult, as angry, as dangerous, when fundamentally the problem is similar to the women who are they're being beaten up regularly in abusive relationships or they are um, take, yeah, taking overdoses or cutting or all those sorts of things. If the, if the central tenet is similar, one group may come to the attention of helping services and one other group might get into the criminal justice system and you get further and further stigmatised and further and further away from compassion and help. And I think that's one way mental health for men, um, it makes it quite hard for them Social systems such as the police, the mental health field and the education system embody dominant cultural beliefs such as the idea that imprisonment deters people from crime. Studies have shown that these institutions are effective in lowering violence and increasing education and safety. On the other hand, these social bodies can reinforce negative self-images that can institutionalize people's thinking and behavior. If you look at more um, areas where there's more poverty, with poverty also comes inequality and um, often um, people are unemployed, uh, which brings a lot of stress to, to, to the family household, which in turn can also increase the risk for alcohol and substance misuse and violence, which also then can potentially result in a higher or increased criminal rates um, and social antisocial behaviour. Um, so, yeah, so I think this is probably linked definitely those groups potentially come from a background where a particular behaviour is in one way a learned behaviour. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. And I think it also can be like some problems are passed from generation to generation as yeah. well. We don't choose our parents, but they are living in a society where some behaviours and norms might be learned and passed on to us from our parents and it might be harder to break out from there than yeah. if you're born into another family where actually they might not have the same amount of issues uh, yeah. or in society or even if you as we talked about before even if there are issues for about mental health within the family it might be how is that recognized by professionals and also within the family how are you containing those concerns really if you've grown up in a family or a household where there's a lot of substance misuse or domestic abuse and violence and if you might not have access to the same um, support with your education because your parents might not be very well educated themselves um, you begin to identify yourself with that kind of behavior so you might it might be a bit of a normalised behaviour, drinking a lot or seeing domestic abuse and violence becomes a day of your everyday life, really. Um, and if you then have society and the people around you just telling you the same things, that this is who you are and this is your behaviour, I know you because you come from this area or you have that, that, that skin colour, that means that you would go out stealing cars or drinking or um, involving yourself in criminal activities, I guess. It's a higher risk for a self, a self fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, it's a bit like a self fulfilling prophecy, isn't it? Exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The area where I grew up in <clears throat> um, was was um, renowned for having crackheads and heroin addicts. It's like from even from when I was young, you know, like you walk around the ends and you know that guy's a smackhead and he's, you know what I mean, he's doing this and he's that. 
from even being young and hanging around with people that I shouldn't really hang around with them. My dad was very strict on me, very, very, very strict on me, and it, it toughened me up. But I couldn't, at the time, I couldn't see, I couldn't see that he was trying to do the best for me and trying to put me in the right direction. I just thought he was just being a cunt, and he, and he didn't like me. Because then I realised that I, I'm, it, it, how, how my living is just normal, you know what I mean? And all that energy there, it just, it, I just took it in the wrong way, and it just made me very angry violent, drinking a lot. Especially like growing up as a culture as well. When I was growing up, the culture is you get smashed. So obviously you started dabbling in drugs, tying drugs. Whereas other people from a different walk of life, they might have been, you know what I mean? They're preparing for their future and going on, you know what I mean? And then as soon as I left school, I left home. And then, yeah, it was hard, especially living on your own, like 17, like you got no money for furniture. I think the first, the first, First flat I had was like a one-room bed sit. And all, when I first moved in there, I didn't even have no electric in there, just fucking a couple garden chairs. I had to live like that for a, for a week, you know what I mean? So I, tr I tried to go to college when I was like 18, 19. I think I, was, I started studying my music. I did really well in my first year. Went on to the, the second year. And then obviously the troubles that I had going on in my life, loves, family, Housing, money situations, all that type of shit. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't really, um, I couldn't keep up with it. So I dropped out, I dropped out my music course. I was just selling drugs, was doing this and that, just, just running around wild. And then when I did hit jail, and then I was speaking to other people doing sentences for similar things that I'm doing, and then I realised, basically, you know what I mean, like a walking cliche, like, you know what I mean, like rapping. Drugs. It's it's more so like where well, I know I'm not that stereotype, but sometimes I do play to that stereotype because that's the way people see me. So it's like the people that people that want to see me, they they're gonna see whatever they want to see regardless. It is tempting to use biology or personal circumstances to explain behavior, but social constructionism turns this idea on its head. Our culture creates rules about how different people should behave. The media, the school, your friends, your family, and of course you are responsible for playing by these rules and for making sure that people around you stick to the rules too. A boy may fear being laughed at if he is upset and he may feel unable to talk about worries or difficulties. Adding to this, if he is from a tough neighborhood or he has witnessed violence in the home, he can learn that violence is a way of managing difficulties in place of talking or seeking support. The reason that I got kicked out um, of my mainstream school um, was for actually bringing a knife into school and putting it to another student's throat. I was at year seven, halfway through year seven, year eight, near year eight. The boy tried running, like running his mouth, like trying to get a bit rude. I went home, I had couldn't stop thinking about the boy. Um, picked up a knife, was ready to go to school, went to school, see the kid, see him start laughing at me. That's it, I just ticked myself, I ran at him, um, well, headlocked him and put it to his throat. And the boy, like, he started crying and that. So obviously I let him, I, I just stopped and let him go. My head a year then come into my lesson, um, pulled me out and yeah, took the knife off of me and um, they just permanently excluded me.
you might want to think about why does this person arrive at the stage where they are like that and i do think there might have often i feel been a start of that and as i said it can be a combination of reasons it could be a little bit the temperament of the child but also what the child experienced and then is the question how does the environment respond to that do they kind of do something to confirm that identity it's always sort of almost with the goody good shoot child everyone notice how good they are and how well and they get praised and the child who doesn't succeed so well you don't actually see those areas where they succeed well and you constantly talk about and by that confirm um, those areas where this child is challenging I mean, if you think about the streaming system, it starts already in school with where you stream children in certain groups of their abilities. And if you're the parent of an able child and your child is put in a group with lots of other able children, of course you will be delighted and happy because the identity of being an able child will be supported. If your child has some difficulties in learning and struggles, whether it's dyslexia or other difficulties or have been stressed or whatever, and then they are input in a group with other children who are not very good in learning, it will develop that identity well, I'm not good at learning, why, why shall I bother? I will never get up to that group. And it starts in that small area and then it will develop. If then some children go in grammar schools, they will get better and better because not only that the abilities are nurtured and supported, they see that confirmed an expectation. And the other kids in the people referral unit We've all been chucked out of the school system because they couldn't fit in. They were thinking, okay, why bother? Um, now I'm in that school of the naughty kids, of the failing kids, and by putting them there, we enhancing that problem and we make it bigger and um, we, we have responsibility for the difficulties they have. In England, men are two times less likely to seek counselling, two times more likely to go to prison, and three times more likely to commit suicide. And these significantly increase if you are from an ethnic minority or are poor. Is this biological or is it linked to the idea that society uses to teach these people about themselves? Right now already I am, um, I am actually on tag um, and I have court coming up in two days. I'm not too sure what the outcome will be, but I'm hoping it's just going to be an extension of tag. There is there is a possibility that uh, I am possibly going to prison because I've been arrested two times since already being on tag. It's something that if I would have grown up differently, then maybe my life would have been different. But I don't know because I haven't grown up differently and this is how, what my life is. <laughs> 